So it was Just, going to a third party ser service. All right. Yeah, we that's what it's supposed to do. Yep. This is the behind yes. the scenes as we get ready to admit everybody. So we are recording. Okay, go ahead. All Mark. right. And here they come. Here they come, walking down the street. Remember those guys, the monkeys? Hey, everybody. Yes. Happy Tuesday. Who's having a good week this week? Are you guys having a good week? If you want to answer me, probably the best way to do it is in the comments. Just click on the chat icon, which is at the bottom of your screen, and you can chat in there. Uh, Tactical's bringing me a cup of tea, which is kind of him. And we're trying not to break the teapot today. So welcome to Navigating the Fall of Empires. This is the third in our five-part series where we're doing a self-reliance voices lessons from legends every night until Thursday. So we've got CJ Kilmer tonight from the Dangerous History Podcast. And this presentation, I remember it being totally eye-opening. Chuck, did you get to see this one at the Self-Reliance Festival where CJ was speaking? I did. I got to see about the last half of it because you know how SRF is. It, but I, I did get to see, uh, yeah, I would say probably the last half of his presentation. Yeah. You know, it's funny because um, he says, you know how SRF is. So Chuck Peoples is my co-host today. He's from Homestead Medical, and he is doing a webinar before Self-Reliance, not a webinar, a workshop before, it starts with a W though, so they're filed right <laughs> next to each other in my head, before the workshop to teach people not only like how to intervene medically, but how to keep people alive after you've stopped them from dying, which are kind of two different things. Because if, if you stop the bleed and then the person gets an infection, you have a problem. And this is very relevant on the homestead because we have many first aid issues, not just because the tactical redneck is here, but also because we have livestock and we end up having to intervene with livestock a lot. But when he says, you know how it is, it's because he's presenting. He's running the medical tent, which means anybody who gets like a tick, has a tick ever actually happened? Um, yes. One time? Word third or fourth one yeah so anybody who gets a tick and needs assistance and then i, I can I also, imagine where that tick might have been or I, if somebody I, has a blood pressure fall or something like he's oh, the guy. we've we've had it all we've actually had somebody sick enough that they got sent to another hospital in another town but that happened in the middle of the night yeah that that involved a, a, a chauffeur who was a little tired the next day too Anyway, yeah. so Chuck is Chuck is saying, you know how it is, because it's like you start watching a session, you get pulled off. I think my favorite part about this webinar has been my undivided attention on the videos, because even when I'm watching, like people are walking up and asking me questions. So for me, this has been really cool. So let's make sure that all of our attendees are, are up and awake and all of those things. Um, guys. How how are you guys doing this night? Are you like energized by this or are you are you like, oh man, I gotta see another webinar? Or or what do you what are you thinking of all this? I'm just curious, write in the comments. Anyway, today we have a pretty cool product giveaway. Do you have one there that you can show us? I do. Tell I us do. what this is, Chuck. So this is the Slushman wrap. Um what this is is it's kind of a multi thing. You can use this as an actual pressure wrap, but the thing about this is, and it looks like it's just a big piece of kind of stretchy nylon, but what it is, is actually you can use this as a tourniquet and it works great for children where they may be too small um, to where a windless tourniquet won't work and animals. It works perfect on animals, canines, whatever you are, but you can loop it wherever it is. You pull it tight and then you just wrap it and it's got know if you could see it on here but it's got little velcro patches all throughout every about eight inches so it'll it, you won't let so if you let go of it for some reason you're not going to let go of the tension it stays tension as far as you go as you wrap it um i've sold this has been one of my 
biggest products that I sell. Um, I, uh, I actually started getting this product when I was looking for something for my grandsons. I wanted a better tourniquet option for them in case something happened. And I, I saw this and I ordered a couple and I really liked it and reached out to the company. And sure enough, I find a phone number because I wanted to call and talk to somebody. And I call this number and I hear, hello. I said, oh, I may have the wrong number. I'm calling about the Slishman tourniquet. Yeah, this is Dr. Slishman. And I talked to him. And after that conversation, I became a one of his distributors. And it, it's a great product. And yeah, we're going to give it away to somebody tonight. They can pick it up at SRF. Yep. Rachel says, Chuck is the reason I keep a tourniquet on me on the property. It's amazing what can go wrong yeah. when you uh you are on a homestead or or anywhere really like sharp things make you bleed that I've, is I've what put, happens when i've worked civilian ems you know your traditional ambulance stuff i put more tourniquets on people as a result of home accidents whether it's a chainsaw accident whether it's a fall or, or something like that than i ever did on gunshot wings now when i worked overseas kind of opposite but um that i i, I use tourniquets more for for those things, uh, it's it ain't gonna work unless it's on your body. You got ninety seconds. Yep. So that's what we're giving away at the end of the episode episode webinar. And if, as usual, Rebecca will scroll through and just choose somebody who's in the Zoom attendees list. If you are watching this on one of our live streams and you're like, I want that tourniquet, I want a chance at that tourniquet. This is a free webinar. You can sign up for it at selfrelianceFestival.com forward slash webinar. You'll get an automated email that has tonight's link and just join us. Um, you will get email reminders of the next couple webinars. And then I'm going to end on Sunday by sending out an email where I ask you if you want to be taken off my email list for Self Reliance Festival because you have not opted into that. And if you do, I will delete you so that if you ever do take another webinar series, you don't end up on the you can't get email from me list. But um, those of you who are on the list already will be getting the Self-Reliance Festival email tonight as well. Um, but you'll just get the one, I promise. I, I'm not going to spam you. It's not what I do. So that drawing happens. And I just want to remind you that all week long, Self-Reliance Festival tickets are $20 off for the digital passes or for the in-person passes April 6th and 7th in Camden, Tennessee at selfreliancefestival.com. You can click on tickets in the top navigation and that expires at midnight on sunday as does access to the recordings of this this webinar series so just putting that out there somebody asked me today if i buy the digital pass and i can't watch all of the sessions live is there a certain amount of time i, I could watch the recordings or do i get those forever and the answer is you get those forever if i have to change video hosts I will upgrade everybody to the new host. So as long as I'm able to host video in the world, then you will have access to those. You know, if, if something weird happens and video is no, no longer a thing, like it goes the way of eight tracks or whatever, that, that might cause some issues. But, you know, you can always download a copy and keep it too if you want to do that. So with that, Chuck, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay. So, um... What do you want to know? You want me to tell you a little story of why I'm at self-reliance? Um, you know, I, I went to self-reliance um, the very first time I walked on the property and I didn't know anybody. Uh, I'd found it. Uh, I, I was sick in the hospital for about five months and I was watching videos. I, I couldn't literally I was I was in ICU. When I finally got my phone, I was able to have some sort of entertainment in the hospital TV. Started watching videos. I was watching uh, some tactical response videos. That's how I found John. Through John, that's how I found Nicole. And then um, started following John. And then this talk of self-reliance festival started coming. And I, I didn't comment a lot. John's live streams or anything like that. Just kind of was lurking and watching and learning. And, and on other people's podcasts and stuff. So I just... I thought, you know, I, I like what they say. I like what this is going to be about. Um, so I decided to drive to Canton, Tennessee and go to the first self-reliance festival. And I'll walk through the gates of the compound. I didn't know a soul there. Um, not one person met people, friendly people. And I thought, yeah, this is 
as what self-reliance festival is about this is my tribe this is this is what i want i i understand and second self-reliance festival i was john asked me to speak and i did and i've taught a class and i have it every single one and now my closest friends really all most of my good friends are all because of that network um and that network changed my life i started a business because of it all from when i made a mention comment sitting inside on the production floor john shop when i i was evan evan was there john was there and i said yeah people keep asking me to you know if I teach classes, I think I'm going to do, I'm going to start a business. And I got the John Willis. No, you're not. You're just talking shit. Watch and out what you say on the floor at SOE. That's right. <laughs> and that, that pissed me off enough to where, yeah, I'm, I'm going to do this. And now here I am. And my business is, grows all the time. This past quarter has been the absolute best quarter I've had. I've, I've sold more gear and, and made more revenue than I had the previous year in this one quarter and uh, booking more classes and very thankful. And it's all because it literally is all because of self-reliance. It's because of people like Nicole and John, um, Tim Cook, Joel Riles, um, you know, of course, Jack, I call Jack the godfather of, of prepping and, and all of this, this whole network. Um, it, it's all these people that you meet and it's all the speakers that you meet. And I, I've got this incredible network of people all over the country that, you know, I've, I've got mentors. The, these people are my mentors and Bob Lester and, and stuff that I can call up anytime and go, hey, should I do this? Is this right? You know, I can message John because, you know, you can't call John. But John has called me one time, which surprised the crap out of me. Yes. Yes. I have gotten a phone call from John Willis. Um, that'll probably ever be the only phone call I've ever I've gotten, gotten a text message one time from him, yeah. too. But I, I could talk to John, Amanda, you, Tim. I mean, it's just amazing. It, it's changed my life so much um, that I, I would never imagine I would be where I am right now, walking into the gates of that very first self-reliance. Awesome. Okay, well, I already like took away one of your items about your, what you're supposed to cover by explaining how the giveaway works. But um, so tell us a little bit about what we're going to see here tonight. Well, we're we're we're. All of this, I mean, you're going to see all the speakers at Self-Reliance have something and bring actionable value. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about, and I don't know if you've seen C.J. Kilmer, if you are, are familiar with him. Um, but his webinar series, you know, Navigating the Fall of Empires, um, he, I don't want to give too much away because I didn't get to see the first half, which I'm really interested to see that, but I did get to see the second half. And and he has a very unique perspective on things. And it just, he really opens my eyes. I remember his was one of the talks at that particular SRF that really opened my eyes to things. Um, and, and I've tried to, you know, followed him and I, I try to see more of the stuff he does. I'd love for him to come back. He, he's an excellent speaker. Um, he, He's just, I, I don't know. I mean, if, if you don't watch it, you'll, once you start watching this, you'll see. He captivates you very quickly. Um, I, I really enjoy what he has to say and what he does. And I, I think it's very actionable information. Yeah, I love how he was a history professor. Yeah. And he has since moved on to go full-time podcasting. And... He started his podcast as a creative outlet because he was able to do things he could not do as a history professor. And that's why he uh, he started the Dangerous History Podcast. Yeah. So with that, let's go into the video. So imagine if you were born in London in 1897. The same year, Queen Victoria celebrated her, uh, what is it, Diamond Jubilee, I think, 60 years on the British throne, which of course at that time included not just the UK, but various colonies, provinces, and dominions scattered across the world. In fact, the sun never set on the British Empire. You controlled not just all of the British Isles, but you controlled uh, the Cape of South Africa. You were colonizing 
Australia, New Zealand, Canada was part of your empire. On top of that, scattered islands and outposts around the world, the Suez Canal in Egypt, and of course, the crown jewel of the British Empire, India. The sun never set on the British Empire. London was the financial and many other types of capital of the world. The British Navy ruled the waves and was larger and more powerful than the next two navies in the world combined. Even though you had lost a little bit uh, to the United States and Germany in recent decades, still in many ways, uh, England was the workshop of the world. In 1899, while you were still a baby, the British fought a nasty war in South Africa known as the Boer War. And while it was kind of a mess and it cost your empire a lot, ultimately at the end of it all, in 1902, you emerged victorious with control of even more pieces of South Africa than before, including the world's most productive gold and diamond mines. It seemed like this might be the one empire that would finally beat the spread and not fall to decline and fall like every single other empire in human history. Then, in 1914, when you would have been 17 years old, and by the way, you have terrible timing, World War I broke out, and your leaders, the, the rulers of your government, decided to use the pretext of the German invasion of Belgium to jump in on that one, even though the initial stages of that war had nothing to do with any sort of attack or threats on Britain. There is a very good chance you would have fought in that war, either as a volunteer in the first couple of years or perhaps as a draftee in the latter years of the war. Assuming you emerged from that war not dead, you would have, if you were paying attention, started to see little cracks and problems in the empire. Some of it started even during the war. Like, for example, the Irish launched yet another rebellion to break free of British control in 1916. And while that rebellion was brutally crushed, they came back a few years later with a much more well-thought-out guerrilla warfare strategy and ultimately won status as a self-governing free state within the British Empire um, by the early 1920s and were on the path to becoming a completely independent republic by the 1940s. Your empire emerged on the winning side of World War I, and on paper reached its peak after World War I in terms of land, people, and resources, picking up additional possessions in Africa, as well as um, a lot of territory in the Middle East at the expense of the declining Ottoman Empire. On paper, you would have looked at your empire in the 1920s and 30s and said, wow, this is even more impressive than it was when I was a little baby. But sometimes appearances can be deceiving, and while you were on the winning side of World War I, it was an extremely costly and pyrrhic victory. And while you picked up all these additional territories, many of them were not going to be easy to hang on to, and, were, and are going to end up costing you more to hang on to uh, than they bring you back in terms of resources and wealth. Also, something not as noticed as it should have been at the time, World War I resulted in the United States overtaking you as the financial juggernaut of the world because your empire emerged from World War I owing the United States uh, government and banks a lot of money. You would have experienced a rough time of it in the interwar years, including the slump, which is what the Brits called the Great Depression. And then, of course, you would have had World War II, and again, you would have emerged from this war on the winning side, but it was even more of a costly, weakening Pyrrhic victory than your victory in World War I was. And in short order, dominoes would have started to fall in the process of what we now call decolonization. Uh, India would get its independence primarily through the nonviolent resistant campaign of Gandhi. Ireland would become a fully independent 
self-governing republic in the late 40s, and the dominoes continued to fall from there. You lost control of the Suez Canal in the aftermath of World War II. You've lost India, the crown jewel of your empire, and the things continue to fall away over the course of the 1950s and 1960s. So when you were reaching uh, your 70s, most of the British Empire was gone, including the African colonies, most of the colonies in Asia. So that by the time you reached, oh, about 85 years old, the British Empire was reduced to not even all of the British Isles, because you lost most of Ireland, and a handful of little outposts and things around the world, and also theoretically the Commonwealth dominions like Canada and Australia that still put the Queen on their money, but that's about it, you know, otherwise they're basically sovereign uh, nation states. And then you would have seen the last little hurrah of empire in 1982, at the age of 85, if you were still alive, with the big win to hang on to the Falkland Islands at the expense of Argentina. This is an empire that went from defeating Napoleon, defeating the Germans twice, to, yeah, we beat Argentina and kept these little, you know, bat guano islands or whatever. This shows you that in the span of one person's lifetime, an empire can go from being a dominant hegemonic superpower to being, at best, kind of a mid-rate, you know, power player, no longer a military or financial superpower, no longer ruling the waves, no longer controlling most of the key choke points of trade and commerce. So empires throughout history rise and fall. One thing that all empires have in common, none of them lasts forever. For the sake of argument and to save time, I'm going to assume that an audience at an event like this is more likely than the average people walking around out there in zombie land to already agree with me on two kind of basic claims. One is, the United States of America is an empire. Two is, the United States of America currently is very much an empire in serious decline. Oh, that's right. And has been for a while. And I'm someone who believes that if things are going bad and falling apart and there's not really any realistic way to fix it in reality grown-up land, your best bet is to admit you have a problem, come face to face with it, and try to manage the crash as best you can. Now unfortunately, like most imperial elites, in fact almost all imperial elites throughout history, ours currently are either don't realize this, or they do, but they're pretending publicly they don't. And so we're in a situation sort of like a plane that is just definitely going down, and the pilots are up there saying, well, if we just believe hard enough in the exceptionalism of this plane, it can magically keep flying. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll, we'll hit a few knobs in the cockpit or whatever, and that'll do it. Um, and unfortunately, they're not doing the right thing, which would be, what's the least destructive way I can crash land this baby? So I'm going to run through things that you see commonly in empires when they're declining and collapsing. Whether it's ancient empires or more modern ones, a lot of the big picture stuff that happens is basically the same, just with different you know, technology and different scenery and all that sort of stuff. So. These are kind of like my 10 things that you're likely to see in an empire that's going through decline and collapse. These are in no particular order, and uh, all of them kind of will reinforce the rest. It sort of turns into like a, a downward spiral of each thing makes the other things worse. So, the first one is... Uh-oh, hopefully there's a dry erase marker. I feel like I'm back teaching in the classroom like I did for 16 years uh, in teaching college history. Every morning, no matter what happened, the first dry erase marker I would pick up that morning would be the one that's about to die. So, guaranteed, guaranteed. So, 
Number one, if you can't read it, wars get stupider. They also tend to get more frequent, by the way. If you look at empires that are like on the rise, that are the rising empires, they usually fight fewer wars than empires on the way down. As counterintuitive as that sounds. Empires on the rise, leaders tend to be a little bit more careful about picking their, their fights. And so they tend to fight fewer wars, and they tend to fight wars that are more, much more likely to win, and where there's a lot more upside if they do win. Whereas empires in decline, it's the other way around. They fight more wars, they tend to fight wars where there's more likelihood it might not, you might not win, and they tend to pick fights where even if they do win, there's not a lot of upside. It's like a costly Pyrrhic victory um, that costs more than whatever it is you win in terms of resources, wealth, etc. So it seems like, to me, from what I can tell, that imperial ruling classes, whether they consciously think this or not, it's sort of there, this idea of they don't want to admit it out loud, but somewhere deep down they kind of realize they're flying a plane that's maybe going to go down. But somehow they convince themselves that if they just pick a few fights with people, they can flex their muscles, stomp the crap out of some other empires or other nations or whatever, show the world they're still badass, they've still got their mojo, and that's it, they can make their empire great again. This is like when the aging, over-the-hill heavyweight champ decides he's going to step back into the ring one more time and try and win that belt one more time. Every now and then there's a freak like George Foreman who can do it. Most of the time, though, it's a bad idea. So you're going to see a lot more wars that are just dumber. They're more irrational. They're, they're wars that are less necessary. They're wars of choice. Again, they're wars where you're less likely to win, and even if you do, it's such a costly victory that you didn't really win anything. And so you see this in many different uh, places. You see it with the Soviets deciding to invade Afghanistan in 1980, right? Um, you see it with the British and a lot of the wars they fought in their waning years, uh, particularly the wars of decolonization. You also see it on display in World War I. Most of the empires that went into World War I thought it was going to be a super easy, barely an inconvenience victory that would make their empire great again, turn around, decline, and show the world they were still badass. Most of the empires that went into World War I did not come out of World War I. And a lot of the empires going into World War I were empires that were already in serious decline. So the Ottoman Empire, the Austrian Empire, the Russian Tsarist Empire, the Romanov Empire, those leaders went into that war, they all thought, oh, for sure, I'm going to win, it's going to be super easy, and I'm going to win all this cool stuff and resources, and I'm going to show the world and, and my own people that my empire is still strong and in its prime. And, well, those empires didn't make it. They didn't survive the war. So very often, empires pick fights uh, where instead of turning around the decline, it speeds it up. Okay? So that's one. Um, and, and even the British, by the way, like I said in my intro, the British won World War I and World War II in terms of they were on the side that won the war technically. Um, but each of those wars weakened their empire in significant ways rather than making them stronger. Second thing. Economic problems increase as an empire is in decline. The economy of a declining empire tends to be more about rent-seeking than it is about increasing productivity and incre even increasing resources. Rent-seeking, if you don't know that term in an economic context, that means you're just trying to grab for yourself a bigger piece of the existing pie. Very often, in, in these situations, it's actually a shrinking pie. Rather than trying to grow the pie overall, like by, you know, increasing productivity. And so, in declining empires, very often, what you see is a scramble of elites becoming ever more kleptocratic, trying to grab more on the way down of a shrinking pie. And they're doing this at the same time, very often they're fighting more wars, and they're often engaging in increased welfare state programs, by the way, too, which I'll get to. 
And how do you finance more wars and more welfare state programs if your economy is stagnant or even declining? Usually they do it through a combination of two things. Number one, just ever increasing taxation, which economics 101, that's only going to make this worse. And then another one that as far as I know, the Romans were the first to discover, which is monetary inflation. That's the other way. Because sooner or later with taxes, you hit a wall where people can't pay anymore and start to resist and evade a lot more. And so what do you do if you still want to fight a bunch of wars and build monuments uh, and hand out free bread to poor people so they don't think about revolution? Well, create more money. And the Romans figured this out by diluting the silver content of their coinage, which was called uh, the denarius. And they gradually, over the course of their decline, just kept adding more and more, you know, tin or whatever to the denarius. Hey, look, we got more coins. We can spend on all we want, not even jack up taxes. But of course, what does that do? Well, it just makes the purchasing power of each denarius that much lower, right? And so very often you get into this downward spiral of economic decline where everything the elites are doing to try and turn the decline around is actually speeding it up, just like with the wars. Everything they're doing to try and fix the situation is actually making it worse and speeding it up. And you can get into really serious problems here. Um, there's a cycle that often occurs where a government engages in monetary inflation. This leads to rising prices. Very often, Rulers do not say, wow, let me stop doing what I'm doing because it's causing the problem. Instead, they use something else to try and treat the symptoms that makes everything worse. So very often, um, a government experiencing inflation resorts to price controls. Great, we'll just decree that stuff only costs so much now. Problem solved. Except that leads to shortages. Because if you're artificially holding the price of stuff below what it really should be, well, whoever's in charge of producing and selling that stuff isn't going to do it anymore. Because why would you, you know, why would you grow wheat and bring it to the market and sell it if you're going to be losing money on every bushel you sell if you're a Roman farmer? And so you typically end up with shortages. And then when that happens, you often end up with things um, like rationing and other controls. And then very often people are trying to, if they're producing these goods, they're trying to avoid bringing them to market. So very often governments will then turn to things like anti-hoarding laws and that sort of stuff. So you see that, for example, happening in the late Roman Empire from about um, late 200s, early 300s onward. This cycle of monetary inflation, price inflation, price controls, shortages, anti-hoarding laws, and essentially uh, economic authoritarianism. Part of the problem, as I mentioned briefly before, is welfare state programs also tend to proliferate during periods of imperial decline. And basically what this is, is the state trying to keep the population docile, loyal, and obedient. So as the Roman Empire declined, they kept getting more and more generous in what they would offer to poor people in terms of handouts, benefits, right, the famous bread and circuses and all that. The British actually did something uh, similar. Uh, it was actually uh, during World War II that the British government laid the foundation for the welfare state that they still have today. Uh, during World War II, and by the way, th this is not coincidence that it happened during World War II because they were trying to figure out how to keep people loyal and supportive of the war effort, and essentially they were buying their loyalty by saying, hey, if you help us win this war, we'll give you all these new welfare programs as goodies as a thank you. And so there was something uh, created during the war called the Beverage Report, which was an official government report that basically said, all right, we need, you know, socialized medicine, we need, you know, all these different uh, social programs and whatever. And then that was implemented right after the war uh, when the Labor Party got voted back into office. Obviously, that only exacerbates your fiscal problems, figuring out how to pay for that while your economy is in serious decline. Another one you see very often, increased authoritarianism at home. Empires, whether it's officially or unofficially, there's always a difference between what, you know, historians and political scientists who study empire, what they would call the, the core or the center and the periphery. And sometimes that's literally physical, 
right? Like the, the fringe frontiers of the empire, it's different than in the, the metropolis. Um, sometimes it's just political. You know, sometimes it's just a matter of certain places are not going to have the same political and economic power within the empire as others, right? So, you know, it's very different if you're, um, you know, out on the frontiers of the Roman Empire versus if you're, like, right in the city of Rome or right in central Italy. Typically, the way empires operate, whether it's official policy or not, in practice, it's usually this way, where they're, they tend to be more authoritarian the further out on the frontiers they are of their empire. And usually they'll start off doing authoritarian things out on the frontier that they would never dream of trying to do back home, you know, in the metropolis uh, center. But sooner or later, those authoritarian methods and practices and things start to filter back home, back to the center. There's a saying to sum this up, it's called, the empire always comes home. And so, um, to give you an example, the British, for a long time, had a very free society at home. They, you know, if you were like in the 1800s, Britain was a very low-tax society, unless there was a major war going on, like against Napoleon. Otherwise, very low taxes, pretty free market. Um, and believe it or not, huge amount of freedom to do things like carry around guns in London. And if you go back to the 1800s, the, the British cops were carrying sticks, but a citizen could just, you know, pack a revolver and walk around. Well, guess what? As the British Empire starts to decline, more and more of those authoritarian things that previously would have been unthinkable at home start to filter back. And a lot of it, again, ties into war. So, for example, very early on in World War I, the British government passes something called the Defense of the Realm Act in 1914. And the Defense of the Realm Act was essentially the first building block of creating a domestic surveillance and police state apparatus in the home territory of the UK. The British had previously run operations like this in India, you know, in Kenya, in, in other places that were the fringe of their empire. They did all sorts of authoritarian, you know, police state, surveillance state type things. But now they're starting to do it at home. Also, by the way, in the immediate aftermath of World War I is when the British first started to pass major gun control legislation at home. Again, there had often been strict rules like you don't want the natives getting access to guns if you're in an African colony or in India or something like that. But the British people at home had a you know, pretty strong right uh, to be armed prior to, I think it was 1921 or 22, immediate aftermath of World War I. And again, it was connected to the war. Um, they, they essentially used, um, they were motivated by the fear of, number one, Irish rebels, and number two, communist revolutionaries in the UK. And so they decided to start passing gun control. That was the beginning of the draconian gun control that the UK has today. In the United States, there's an interesting case. Um, I would recommend anybody interested in this, go uh, look up a book. It's a big, dense book, but it's, it's very good, by a great historian named Alfred McCoy, the book is called Policing America's Empire. And what you find is a lot of authoritarian police state type procedures and things that eventually come home to the United States, a lot of it originated in the US counterinsurgency campaigns in the Philippines at the turn of the last century. And again, things that would have been considered unthinkable to do back home in the lower 48, they do them for generations in the Philippines, and then eventually those practices filter back home. And you can see this, by the way, you can see uh, each significant increase in things like police mil militarization at home here was preceded by messy counterinsurgency campaigns somewhere far away, where those sorts of things were considered okay to do, but eventually they come home. So, for example, in the aftermath of the Vietnam War, there's a significant spike in police militarization in this country. That's when we get our first SWAT teams and a lot of other you know, things that we associate with the modern uh, militarized police. All right, we interrupt this program to bring you an important update from the Holler Homestead. Just kidding. Um, so how is how familiar is that starting to sound to everybody? I'm really curious. Like, were you listening to that going, check, check, check? Just wondering. It's just kind of, uh, as he gets into that, uh, we had a lot of fun with memes for CJ getting ready for this webinar because of all the Roman Empire 
analogies that can come up and all of these other things. But one of the things I love about historians is the story part of historians. When they really dive into a topic, they've looked at things from so many different angles that just off the top of his head, he can tell an awesome story. That's one of the great things about the Dangerous History podcast as well. So yeah, it was like watching the news. Exactly. It's going to get more like that. It's going to get so Chuck's Chuck's entering into realm of what he's seen. Um, I want to do a quick poll of the audience, though, and we did this yesterday. Um, give me a second to I need to find the thing I need. Um, Nicole can't use her stuff. It should just let me. Well, it's being piggly. So hold on. Piggly is a new word that I've just made up to indicate that my computer is being difficult for a second. And that is just, I, I have gotten used to using StreamYard as a webinar thing. And so using Zoom, the controls are a little bit different, but here we go. There it is. And if Zoom had not just completely disappeared off my, my desk, you would already be seeing this, but here we go. So the question for you is this. What do you see as signs of a fall of our empire? And in the comments, you can just write the numbers that fit. So we have one, incompetent leaders, two, a corrupt monetary system, three, cultural decay, four, boom, 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 five, there are no signs, there are no problems. Six. What are you guys seeing? Anybody see any of those signs? One, two, three, four, and six we've got from Marcy. <laughs> what do you think, Chuck? It's all of it except for number five. I mean, if you if you look at what it is, and he even mentioned, uh, uh, you know, he mentioned about the monetary stuff, but if you even look at when when you start going and looking at our present state, go back to when he said this, and it was almost like he was writing a script of what's happened even in the last six months. Um, it, it, it's very interesting. I, I mean, just as he's talking about all those steps, yep, check. It's almost like what is going on today and the powers that be are following that script. Like they have gotten that fall of the empire, and that's exactly what they're following and doing. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes that I've heard, I don't know if it comes from Jack Spierko, but I've heard it on his podcast is he says, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Yeah. Right. So um, one of the best things that we can look at are what has happened in the past so that we can see what the shape might look like in the future. But it's really hard to... Um, to know what the next things are going to be. And that's why when, when people are running out there saying, this is happening, this is happening, and this is the next thing that's going to happen. And they're so very specific and it's so very disastrous. So you need to take this next action and spend your money on my, whatever my, you know, crazy bucket of food delivery program or whatever it is that isn't, like the problem is you use lose credibility when things don't crash i have somebody i know who after obama got elected was convinced that martial law was going to be declared and all of the things were going to happen and he sold everything he he owned rented a place in the country far away from everything else and started hunting and living off the land as best as he could and about four years later it hadn't happened yet but he had burned through all of the wealth he had built his whole life because he wasn't working during that time. And it's because he went all in on the disaster. And that's part of why we do self-reliance festivals to bring us to an out of the fear place. Now you're wondering, Nicole, how can I be in an out of the fear place with CJ telling me about the decline of empires? Well, we will get there. We will get there. He does. The best thing about this is towards the end, he's going to start talking about what sorts of transitions can happen 
that are not just, you know, martial law, violence, carnage, starvation, meltdown, and all sorts of those things. Like what has happened in other transitions like this that are less scary? And it's good to know those exist because you can be rooting for something different, right? You can be rooting for the thing you want to have happen. And sometimes when we visualize what we want to have happen, we make decisions and take actions that help make that happen because it's foremost in our mind. So I'm not, I'm not saying that visualizing it makes it so magically. You start taking action to make that happen. Um, I also do want to say something here because as we were putting together this webinar series, I realized that my buddy CJ, his wife has had a kind of a very unfortunate medical situation come up. So she had to have surgery, which meant she couldn't work anymore. And he's, you know, helping take care of her, which means he's earning less. And um, the ultimate solution was that they needed to fuse um, some of her spinal vertebrae. Vertebrae, yeah, yeah those. Vertebrae. Both of the medical guys on today, so he can tell me the right words. Um, and the surgery happened was successful. She went home and was being driven to PT when the person driving her had to slam on the brakes. And she is back in the emergency room now. So if if anybody wants to help somebody in our community with um, kind of the out of control situation that the medical system is now, uh, there is a GoFundMe if you want to kick 5, 10, 20, whatever. Like, do consider supporting CJ because I know this has both been very hard for him in a year where he quit drinking. He's been sober for just about over a year now, which is pretty amazing through all of these medical things. Um, but also like one of ours, we all know that the medical system is a problem and it's a problem when you get sick. So I just, I wanted to throw that out in this little break in case anybody feels like helping him out. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to you to tell us, well, we've already kind of heard Chuck's story. Can you tell us Kiri's story? Kiri's on here today. Oh, is she here? Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. Well, K Kiri has been of recent a big inspiration to me her and glenn for what they've done because kiri went from not only has she done a personal transformation but she started a business she stuck to it um and and what she's done her products are amazing she's doing it all on her own and she's just like non-stop with it she'll say she's going to do something and the next week she's done it um and what they've done, I mean, they, they've they've moved into the land that they have now, they're homesteading. They are taking stuff from their land and things that they grow and they're making products and they're supporting themselves for it. I, I know Glenn still works, but I, I think it's an amazing story. It's inspiration. And I love to see if you get on her website um, and and see some of the uh, the products that they have They're they're It's great stuff. And, and she's just she's a force to be reckoned with because she's. Physically, she has transformed herself and she lost a bunch of weight and is getting in shape and taking her health serious. But then just how she she's unbelievable in what she's done in such a short time with a business and how successful it is. And she's if you look at her branding and you look at the, the labels and just all the little details, her website's great. It's 10 times better than mine. I may have her have to do mine. I, I Mine needs work. But her, hers is it just looks good and it tells the story and the way it's broken down and just her and Glenn are really an inspiration. Plus they're making, you know, corn brief to bring to the festivals that I can't wait to eat. And yeah, we're them. all, I'm on there with you. <laughs> and it, but if you're around them, they're infectious. They're, they are, they're, they're absolutely infectious to be around. And uh, it's just, if you're not following Carrie and you're, you're not seeing what they do, you're losing out um and just to sit and talk to them um i i just i, I don't know i I've, I've of late she just somebody who really does and she she inspires me and i try to promote her stuff as much as everybody else's because this is how we are earning our income and it's this little network that does it and i wouldn't my business would not be successful if it wasn't for the support i got from the community here, what we have, the network, and then how it's kind of all come together with the three sister festivals and everybody's one big community. But 
it's grown out past that and it keeps growing from that but it it's it's the support how we support each other and i just think it's great i mean carrie if you just sit back and watch it's like in a year's time a little over a year's time complete from not having it to where she has thunderhill farms now and it's just it's amazing um uh, and I, I mean she's much quicker than what i did and it's just like i'm like i gotta catch up with carrie now she started she's passed me you know uh, it, it really reminds me of evan from radio made easy how quickly and she getting off the paycheck plantation and that you know that's my goal and i'm like damn it these people are beating me i've got to catch up and 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 get off that because that's where i want to be and that's what friendly competition is yeah it you know it's it be, it's competition, but not in a bad way or not in a jealousy way. You're like, no. dang, good job. How'd you do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Evan has helped me. I've, uh, you know, I've, Evan's given me advice on business stuff. And, and, you know, Evan's just, if you never talk to Evan, he's, he's a genius. I mean, I like to kid with him because, you know, his voice never gets over a certain level and it's always comical, but he's, he's absolutely incredibly intelligent and the way he looks and thinks at things. And, Carrie kind of reminds me of that um, and what they've done. I mean, her, what she's doing now reminds me how quickly Evan rose up and got off that pan, that paycheck plantation. And she did that. I mean, that's I my goal. Evan got like booted off the pay, paycheck. Yeah, he did. He, he was forced, but it, it was, he, he got booted off, had nothing to do and, and he made it happen. And he's got an incredible business now. And, and I really think, that's what Carrie's doing with hers. Hers is going to be an incredible. She's got good products. She believes in it and she works hard. And anybody who's thinking about starting a business, look at these people, look what they've done in such a short amount of time. You can't tell me you can't do it, you, but you just got to love what you're doing. I mean, you could see that with Carrie. You could see that with Evan, that they enjoy what they do and they have the passion. And it's, it's same with me. I, I love teaching the medical stuff. I mean, dealing with all the retail stuff and putting kits together and stuff it's a pain in the ass. It really is, but it goes hand in hand. But I, all my kits are hand built by me because it's stuff I've used, but I, I just really like what Carrie's done because it, it's a true passion of what she's done. And she works with Amanda and her, you know, and I, I know she's close with Amanda and, and they bounce off ideas of each other, but you know, you, you, you've got to jump in and see this. That's what self-reliance festival is all about is to see all of this flourish and how all of this, has grown out of it all these businesses and you know they, they go from attendees to vendors and it, it, it to me it's it's just great to see that to look around and see all of the success yeah, all 10 years from now we're just going to be a bunch of vendors getting together yeah yeah it's exactly I mean, fine that'll be fine because um that's how counter economies grow right Right. I mean, with Evan and I, we trade products. We we literally barter out our products. You know, I'll get something from him. He'll get something from me. Uh, and it's great. It, it, it's 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 we're doing that counter economy already. Right. That's the way you do it is you get started. Right. Well, talk to yeah. us about this because uh, you get to talk about. So this festival isn't just homesteading. It's not just preparedness. It's homesteading preparedness. We right. talked about homesteading sessions yesterday. Talk us through some of the preparedness stuff we got going on and some of these faces we see here. Well, um, you know, if if you're not familiar with Chris Weatherman, um, Angry America, I mean, that alone is, he kind of has, I, I call it, you know, the guidebook of how to prepare with his books. If you haven't listened to him, the Going Home series, get it, put it up. They're all on audiobook. Listen to every single one of them because you'll realize very quickly how maybe ill-prepared you are because those books did that for me. You've got that alone from Chris. And he's not just an author, somebody writing books and writing fiction. He's done it. He was a contestant on Alone, you know, the TV show. He, he's done these things. He's He's been in the field. Um, to, I mean, it, you can look at Tim Cook the way for, for preparedness and, and what he does. Um, you know, of course, you're going to be at the, the SOE compound look around you know while you're there look what john has done um you know his his 323,000 chickens he has or however many he has now and now the sheep he has more i mean just everything that he's done and he's built there on that just that 10 acres um gosh, who, who 
I, my mind's gone blank from all the the attendees now. I got to pull it up, but I mean, it, it's it's the people that that, that are there. Uh, Grumpy Acres uh, is Grumpy speaking. I, I believe they are, aren't they? Um. Yes, they are. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I guess the image I thought I pulled up was that, and instead, what I was showing people was yeah. file chaos. You've you've got Grumpy Acres, who they have got. You know, you want to know about freeze drying? You want to know about homesteading? The what they moved from one state to another and started all over in Kansas. Um, Sonny, who is probably, I, I'm literally capsized, captivated by, by Sonny every single time he speaks. Um, not alone just his background, where he comes from, but what, what he does, how he does it. And he's probably, I consider him one of the most dangerous men in this world that I want to always make sure that I stay on his very good side and, and never piss him off. Um, you know, he's teaching that class on Friday. If you don't take mine, take his. Um, I, I wish I could take his. Um, you know, we're, I'm going to be speaking on on medical stuff, and I'm going more on your preparedness journey of, of being prepared medically, not just carrying that tourniquet in your everyday carry of what you need long term. Not not just only the training, but the supplies and what you think you may have is not enough. Um, you know, who else? I, I know I'm missing well, we somebody. Mike that... Shelby from Forward Observer. Oh. We've also got a session yeah. on uh, D, like getting off the tech Big Brother stuff. Yeah, that that, that was the one I was. It. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was trying to recall that one. But Mike Shelby, Forward Observer, if you're not looking at his stuff and his his podcast and stuff, I mean, his, his stuff is amazing. Um, there's just so much to learn. Every single session is actionable information. And if you're if you're not, that's what I. The great thing about it is the networking. There's so much networking that is done at Self Reliance Festival. A lot of the times, that networking you're missing out on some of the speakers, and that's happened to me. I don't know how many times, but. You get one-on-one -on -one time with these people. Where yeah, if you come to Self Reliance Festival in person, we then give you fifty percent off the digital recordings because we know that what you're going to want to do is see some of the things you didn't see. So that's been a, an ongoing thing that happens for anybody who comes all, there. All my network now and people that I call friends and stuff, like I said earlier, is is a result of SRF and all these other festivals that people, you know, I I, I talk to. Chris Watkins almost every day. Um, of course, John and Amanda are good friends. You, there's um, Jason Sparks from Kentucky Sustainable Living. Um, Spags, who, you know, is why well, I wish he could be there this time, but his new job is kind of, he's got responsibilities with that. But, you know, just all the people, there's people here in the chat that I know, um, you know, and, and you know, I, I've, I've got very good friends. Um, all my friends now, it's just, that's my tribe. I mean, you will build a tribe. You will build your community. If you come and participate, don't lay in the back and not talk, get out there, walk up to people, introduce yourself. And yeah, I'm telling you, it'll be life-changing. Well, it's been fun watching y'all talk to each other in the comments too, and get to know each other as part of this webinar. So I think Rebecca has the link to the telegram group. Do you, Rebecca? She's going to look it up. Um, we'll throw a link if Rebecca doesn't get it, I'll do it during the next video session, but join, join the telegram group and we'll start talking to people like join the self-reliance festival one, the living free in Tennessee one Toolman Tim has a really good one. And it's just a lot of people that you like, you can go in there and kick around ideas for your, if you're starting a side hustle, like, what do I call my farm? Here are some name ideas. What do you all think of it? And that really helps shortcut it. Like I, I did that today earlier where I needed to name something and I it, like hearing different people say names is a great way to start. So with that, we're going to run, we're going to, we're going to flow into the second half of CJ's talk and we'll get you the, the, the telegram links while, while it's playing. Possibly the only empire I'm aware of that didn't get more authoritarian as it was declining was the Soviet Empire, and a lot of that is just the bizarre exception of Mikhail Gorbachev being a decent guy and not wanting to be a tyrant 
And so Gorbachev was actually making the Soviet system freer in the latter days of the Soviet empire, but that is abnormal. Typically, that is not, not what an empire in serious decline uh, is likely to do. Next one. Average quality of your leadership declines drastically and noticeably. <laughs> I know. Sounds crazy. But just as a theoretical proposition, use all the imagination you have. <laughs> leaders tend to become, on average, there's the occasional individual exception, but leaders tend to become more corrupt and less competent as the empire declines. And yeah, and you see this whether it's, it's Rome, whether it's um, the Soviet Empire, you know, whether it's the latter days of the Ottoman Empire, like almost any empire you could think of, especially if it went through kind of a long protracted decline, you can see the average quality of leadership just going down and down. And part of it is that, cl that kleptocratic impulse I mentioned before, where leaders more and more are just fighting over getting bigger pieces of a shrinking pie as the empire falls apart. Empires always have a certain amount of corruption baked into how they operate. But when an empire is rising and kind of strong and healthy, the corruption is kept within practical limits where the corruption is not going to destroy the whole system. But empires in serious decline, the corruption just goes totally off the reservation, way out of, way out of hand, way out of proportion, to where it actually can be a fatal threat to the system itself continuing to operate and survive. In addition to leaders tending to become less competent and more corrupt as an empire declines, another thing that happens, and again, this might shock you, but just use your imagination as best you can, very often, not always, but very often, the average age of leaders noticeably increases. So you go from an empire where like, a lot of your top leaders are maybe like 40s, you know, the older ones are 50s, to where they might be in their 70s or even older. Yes, every other empire has their own kind of boomer generation, I guess, that just won't leave, that won't retire. So you see this, for example, in the latter years of the Soviet Union, where prior to Gorbachev coming in, he was kind of young and unusual in many ways when he came in, but prior to Gorbachev, you had a succession of Soviet leaders who were all very old, senile, barely knew what was going on, just kind of, you know, and, and surrounded by yes-men telling them they were brilliant and awesome and the greatest leader ever. So, you know, Leonid Brezhnev is a great example of this, and then there were a couple of other leaders that served briefly after him, uh, where they, they would come in, uh, what was it, uh, uh, Chernenko and, um, oh, one other guy, and, and Dropov, that came in after Brezhnev finally died. And they would come in, take over, and within like a, a year or two, they'd be dead because they were that old and unhealthy and whatever when they came in. To the point where Ronald Reagan actually joked about this. By the way, Reagan, everyone was like, oh, is he too old to be president? I believe he was, what, 67 or 68 when he was elected to his first term? That's a decade younger than all of our recent, you know, contenders for the presidency, right? But everybody back then was like, oh my God, is Reagan too old? Now it's like, hey, he's 79. He's still got a couple good decades left in him, you know? And I think part of it is that as empires grind along and get bigger and more complicated and the bureaucracy gets bigger and more complicated over time, it's just sort of the natural tendency, more and more, in order to rise through the ranks of the state, it's all about just corruption, nepotism, and how long are you there. Whereas when an empire is not so burdened with excessive bureaucracy and complexity and all that, there's more opportunity for younger people to rise to high positions if they're competent. But increasingly, it's just about, you know, how many great corruption connections do you have and how long have you stuck around? I don't know if you can imagine any leaders currently who fit that description, but, you know, maybe if you try hard enough, you could, you could think of one. Next thing, quality of military tends to decline. And there's a lot of different ways this can happen. 
Part of it has to do with the increasing inefficiency and corruption of the system itself, the, the state that actually you know, creates and funds the militaries. Part of it has to do with the kinds of wars that these empires are fighting. Increasingly, they're not the kinds of wars that your best people are eager to go sign up for, as it becomes obvious that these are these messy, nasty wars I talked about before, these stupid wars. Um, partly it has to do with, if you start off with something like citizen soldiers over time, it stops being that, whether it's Rome, United States, whatever. You start off with this ideal of the citizen soldier, who is not a full-time professional soldier, um, but you know, has some training, does do some militia practice, whatever it is, and then in time of war, drops his plow, picks up his weapon, and goes out. Eventually, that becomes a separate professional caste. It becomes a career. And then, like with the Praetorian Guard in Rome, they become a separate little like government within the government unto themselves. Um, so very often, you end up with militaries where the loyalty is not to the state, the nation, the empire as a whole, but instead to whoever's paying you, whoever happens to be your general, whoever happens to be you know, your local kind of warlord or whatever like that. Another thing that often happens is um, increased resort to conscription. And obviously that, that creates problems. So in general, uh, morale and motivation start to be problems more and more. Troops become you know, less uh, reliable and trustworthy. And another thing that happens, I think in many cases, is that an empire gets to a point where it's no longer fighting near peer competitors. And so that tends to make their military uh, complacent, conservative in the sense of not you know, keeping up with innovations and all that. Um, and as with the political leadership, more and more, how do you become a general in a declining empire's military? Less to do with merit and more to do with time served, connections, corruption, politics, etc. So, <clears throat> by the way, there's an interesting meme I've seen going around. Uh, it shows General Dwight Eisenhower in his full military getup with all his decorations and everything. And then next to him is, I think it was Petraeus in his military getup. And Petraeus has like 10 times as many ribbons and medals and decorations as Dwight Eisenhower. And on the meme, under Eisenhower, it says, won a war. Under Petraeus, it says, lost a war. And then I think the meme said something like, this is what happens in a participation trophy society. My thinking was, real gangsters don't got to flex because they know they got them. Next thing, infrastructure deteriorates. As the economy declines and the fiscal situation becomes more and more of a problem and there might be hyperinflation, all these sorts of things, one way or another, the infrastructure is not getting properly maintained. Whether it's you know, the roads, bridges, and aqueducts, aqueducts of the Romans, or whether it's, I don't know, train tracks that run through Ohio. <laughs> but basically, things just start to degrade. New infrastructure isn't being built as much. I mean, just think about it. Can you imagine today's U.S. government building the interstate highway system and getting it done as quickly as... How about this? Can you imagine today's U.S. government building the Panama Canal and getting it done quickly and a little bit under budget. See, I can imagine senile leaders about to keel over a lot easier than I can imagine something like that. That's fantastic. That's, um, you know, flying pigs. And you see this uh, as well with the Soviet Empire, right? You have things like um, the Chernobyl meltdown, for example, and other instances of the Soviet uh, infrastructure just falling apart not being properly maintained, all that sort of stuff in the 1970s and 80s. Next thing I'll mention. Culture degenerates, for lack of a better term. And here, I think a big part of the problem that leads to cultural degeneration during a declining empire is 
those economic motives of a shrinking or stagnant economy, increased inflation, economic instability, they tend to create a high time preference population. People just get incentivized, naturally, logically, to think more in terms of, you know what, I'd rather just consume and have a good time now because things just keep getting worse every year. Um, my therapist uh, defined depression as rumination without hope. Whether they admit it explicitly or not, people often can kind of tell when their, their system, their country, their empire is in decline. And it tends to make more of a high time preference society. <clears throat> And then this then bleeds over into other behaviors, not just economic behaviors, where people increasingly become more about instant gratification rather than about, you know, per perhaps sacrificing now for the sake of a better tomorrow. If you think tomorrow is going to be worse no matter what you do, who cares? Have a good time today. And um, you see this in the elites. As they're being kleptocrats and looting everything, they will... Um, they'll engage in more blatant, conspicuous consumption. And if you've ever watched any of like our Hunger Games, uh, political or Hollywood events, that, that's what you're looking at. You're looking at um, conspicuous consumption. Also, by the way, and I'm not sure why this is, there's an increased tendency for societies in serious uh, decline to have people suddenly get super obsessed with gender and with blurring gender norms and everything. I don't know, you know if there's a real good explanation for why this is, but it's very common in a declining empire. Um, and I'll try and wrap up as quick as I can here. Um, increased political crises. <clears throat> and this can be in the form of Increased political instability at home, political crises, constitutional crises, you know, governments being overthrown or nearly overthrown, and it also can take the form of increased rebellions out in the provinces. As people who have not been happy in the empire realize the empire is weakening and take their opportunity, as the Irish did, to rebel when their overlords seem to be losing their power and strength. <clears throat> Next one, private sector crime tends to increase. So <clears throat> you have a state that's increasingly being predatory on you by taking more of your taxes, being more authoritarian, all these things. And at the same time, that state is no longer doing as effective of a job as they used to of like keeping you safe from bandits and pirates and thieves and whatever. And in an extreme case, this can turn into what they call anarcho-tyranny, which I would argue is what you have, say, in San Francisco, where if some guy comes into your store and walks out with 500 bucks worth of stuff, the authorities won't do anything. But if you use a baseball bat to stop that guy from stealing stuff out of your store, you get in trouble, right? They'll come after you if you, you know, miss a few bucks on your taxes, but they're not going to do a good job protecting you when, I don't know, some crazy guy is shooting up your kid's school. <clears throat> and then the last thing I'll mention real quick is just what tends to happen in the aftermath of an empire. It can go a lot of different ways. You can have a full-on collapse into a dark age, as happened to the Romans or the Mycenaean Greeks or others. I don't think that's very likely in today's world unless there's something as drastic as like full-blown nuclear war. But you can end up in the situation where there's a revolution, like for example happened to the Tsarist Empire overthrown uh, by the Bolsheviks. <clears throat> you can end up in a situation where the empire loses its colonies but the home government remains intact, as for example happened to the British. Or um, you can end up in various combinations like what happened to the Soviets. And basically, I've come to believe that sort of the last straw for a collapsing empire, and this is my closing thought, <clears throat> that the last straw for a collapsing empire is actually narrative. Empires live on narrative. And the narrative of the empire and all the good it does and why you should support it and believe it and why it's the best empire ever never lines up 100% with the reality. But as with the corruption, there's limits, right? And so, if you were looking at the narrative of the American Empire in 1965, 
it wasn't that far off from reality. But if you're looking at the narrative of the American empire today, all of the rhetoric about why the American empire is the greatest thing, and they wouldn't call it the American empire, but why you know, the US and is a force for good in the world and the liberal rules-based economic world order and all this sort of thing, and all the things that it's supposedly bringing you and us as regular people in the cheap seats, that narrative is becoming so far divergent from what your own eyes tell you when you walk around and look, at a certain point, the narrative can't stand up to the evidence of reality. Same thing happened with the Soviet Empire. They had all this rhetoric of communist utopia, and it was never that, obviously. But over time, it got even more and more divorced, more and more the opposite of what all the rhetoric said. And eventually, when the narrative completely collapses, that's very often the last straw of that empire. So anyway, Thank you for listening, and I uh, appreciate your time. All right, guys. That's eye-opening, isn't it? I'm assuming you can hear me, yes? Yes. Okay, good. I unmuted. It's, uh, yeah. So, they just, the zingers just keep coming in that one, don't they? Who has any comments or questions? If you do, put question in all caps into the comments and we'll just talk about that. Chuck, did it, did it make you want to ask questions? Like, what things were you thinking about? Well, I just... If you listen to really all the things he was saying, um, I mean, I keep referring back, thinking of what's going on. Like, when he was talking about more wars were going to happen and dumb wars, well, look what's happening right now. And... When, you know, when he, he spoke about that earlier, but now it, it, it it's a playbook. I mean, it's almost like he's reciting the playbook of what is present day. And I keep laughing about all this stuff from the age stuff to all this. And then how, how he was talking about, you know, um, earlier on the first part of the video, even when he talked about the, the currency thing, you know, as far as a corrupt currency. Well, I, I, I didn't mention it earlier, but it just strikes me the digital currency is just that. So they can slip, flip a switch and turn you off. You have no control over anything because you've bought or done something they don't like. Um, I, I just all of it is just it, it, it's, it's almost hard to wrap your head around it when you go back and listen to the things he was saying then to what is present day right now. And it's like, is this guy psychic or... Yeah, it just it's it's almost funny to me because he's really predicting and you can see history as, as you know, it, it's echoing. I mean, it, it, it's it's very mirroring of, of what has happened before and what is happening now. Yeah, Don says they're all dumb wars. I like how item number one is stupid wars. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. I'm not sure what a smart war is, but we've done a lot of dumb wars in my lifetime. Well, and if you look at our leaders, you know, he was talking about the degrading and leadership quality. Um, I mean, that is so, that, that's exactly what's happened. And the, I, I just keep thinking of, you see the true agenda after they've been in there, after they do all their little fun stuff. But if you look at what our current administration is, the very first thing day one in office is killing that pipeline simply because if you go and investigate that and you look at the history of that, you'll see why, how it ties back to, that was just a favor to a donor who gave him a lot of money to get him where he was at. That had nothing to do with the environment whatsoever. Yep. It was to keep the rich people rich. Okay, so who wants to talk about building your empire while theirs crumbles? Put why in the comments if you want to talk about that if that's a topic that interests you don't worry i'm not going to talk about it for an hour oh we got a why from josh dana excellent rachel yep well here's the thing because we had such a hard time choosing which videos to play for this we uh, did arrange some free giveaways as part of the webinar series and jack spierko did a presentation after cj at this event that was titled build your empire while theirs crumble and it was a perfect complement 
to what CJ did. So it was like a one, two punch, but I didn't want to keep you on a webinar till 11 o'clock at night watching that. So I think Rebecca, do you have the link for that? If you don't, I can drop it in. I emailed it to you, but it was a little bit late in the game. So we're going to drop the link to that in the comments, but I also have it in the follow-up email that's coming out right after this, which has the download for this and all of that. So we'll get it into the chat. And that is your freebie, freebie Jack Spierko, build your empire while theirs crumbles. So it was really fun working with Jack to co-promote this uh, webinar and then be like, by the way, you're not one of the sessions, but we're doing a free giveaway. <laughs> so, um, this is just a link that will play on YouTube for you. It'll be good through midnight on Sunday. So definitely put that in your listening queue because his presentation was fantastic. So I guess we would be lax if we didn't remind people they can still get digital passes and passes, right? Right, Chuck? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Get. Um, I, I was just thinking when you were talking earlier about the digital passes. Um, I mean, there's something to be said about... you. Being in person is a whole different experience, and I highly recommend that. Come do whatever you can to be there in person. But if you can't, get the digital passes because you're going to miss things that you won't see anywhere else and may not see again. Because some of the presenters, like John Willis, you have no idea what's he going to do. He doesn't have a script. He just gets up there and talks, and it's all off the cuff. And there's such valuable things, it's hard to tell what he comes up with and what comes out of his mouth. But if you're not listening, you're missing out. Yeah. So all of his stuff is predicated by asking questions. And if you don't ask questions, then he doesn't he doesn't answer it. And one of his presentations is all about doing stuff um, for for the you know homestead rather than all of the business things that you could do so i i just think that that is it was an interesting day but at the same time that told us that people were more concerned about getting food than anything else so well at that particular event yeah yeah that yeah it, it was but i well, speaking of food, I mean, I, I, I forgot to mention this earlier. One of the things, because you told me a couple of weeks ago this was happening, but um, Alan uh, doing the, uh, the the kitchen stuff. And, and that, I'm actually really excited about that because... The self-reliant kitchen, I know. Yeah, it's the like... self-reliant kitchen. And then if you're not familiar with Leslie, who does all the, the, the plant medicine basics, I'm actually going to her stuff. I've, I've been in one of her other presentations in Kentucky, and I'm telling you, that's something that I'm personally trying to learn more of to, to present in my classes. And she is phenomenal with it. And I actually got to talk with her one-on-one -on -one quite a bit uh, last year, last fall. And she's, that's something you don't want to miss. Yep. All right. So coupon code webinar 20, if you decide to do that. And um, Rebecca, are you ready to do the drawing for the wrap, the pressure wrap? Guys, you got to pick this up from Chuck Peoples. You can do it. You pick it up from him in April or October. Just got to let us know which one. Okay. I am um... Andrew G. Andrew G. If you have, um, if you're still on, I assume you're still on, send me an email, Nicole at livingfreeintennessee.com, and we'll make arrangements for that. Congratulations. I have one more giveaway. Okay. Two pounds of hollow roast. The person we gave it to can't pick it up. And she asked me to pass it on to somebody oh. else. So Ooh. two pounds oh. of hollow roast coffee. Okay. I'll try not to cheat. <laughs> yeah, I, I would pick myself for that. Uh, uh, Dana LaPointe. Dana LaPointe. Email me, Nicole, livingfreeintennessee.com. Let me know uh, when you're picking that up. Congratulations on the hollow roast. And uh, Marcy, thanks for paying that forward. You probably wondered why we didn't do this yesterday, but I was like, eh, we, we've gone long enough. And speaking of which, we've gone long enough. So here's what's going to happen from here. We are going to close for the night and you will get an email with 
the links to the recordings, the link to the freebie that we had for Jack Spierko's presentation. It'll also have tomorrow's Zoom link in it for you. Let's thank Chuck, though. Chuck, it was great having you on today. Thank you. I've, I've always loved being this, and I always, I, I just always like to be part of SRF. And if I can say anything else, just go. Just, just don't double think. Don't do anything. Just buy the tickets and show up. That's all you have to do. SRF will take you in from there, and it'll change your life. Yeah. So tomorrow we'll be doing John Willis's session. No one is coming to save you which is a big Q&A session about everything. And in parentheses, we put, so save yourself. It's a great, it's always, it's just it's always a great session with him. And um, tomorrow's giveaway is kind of a major big deal. Oh? I'm not even sure I should say what it is today. It's SOE gear. Wow. Oh. Oh. It's a really nice piece of SOE gear. So I wouldn't miss that one tomorrow. I'm just saying. Anyway, so we'll see you all later, guys. Thank you so much for making time. And it'll be 7 p.m. tomorrow.